In 1878, a horrific tragedy would shake England to its very core. It was the worst maritime disaster ever on the River Thames, claiming over 600 lives. It's an event that's often overlooked and forgotten, but it's certainly one that deserves to be remembered. This is the tragic story of the SS Princess Alice. It's Tuesday the 3rd of September 1878. It is a beautifully sunny day, one of the first after a very wet and dreary August. The perfect day for a trip along the River Thames all the way to Sheerness on one of the wonderful pleasure steamers. Sheerness was a great place for a little getaway. It's where the Thames opens up to the sea. There was a pier, a promenade and a seaside resort. What more could you possibly want? These trips allowed people to escape the hustle, the bustle and the smog of London and take them to much needed fresh sea air. The fair made these trips attractive too, around two shillings which was in reach of the upper working classes. At 10.30am crowds of people, particularly families, flocked to Swan Pier which was near London Bridge to board the very popular SS Princess Alice, a paddle steamer that was certainly fit to bear the name of the princess. She belonged to the prestigious London Steamboat Company, and they owned a few other pleasure steamers which of course also were regally named. The Princess Alice though, she was special. She had once carried the Shah of Persia along the Thames to Greenwich, and was therefore known as the Shah's Boat, making her the most popular of all. She had a reputation for being safe with an experienced crew, and she also had a saloon deck which had a band that played live music. A lovely and generous woman called Susanna had promised to take the ladies from her Bible class for a well-deserved day out on the Princess Alice. Originally she had planned the trip for the 5th of September, but when she saw how glorious the weather would be on the 3rd, she excitedly proclaimed that today's the day and she sent messages all around to announce the news. The class members had been eagerly awaiting the trip and so, on receipt of Susanna's message, 30 women and their children arrived at the pier ready for a day of fun and relaxation. The captain was to be William Grinstead. He was a seasoned captain and very good at his job. As it was such a beautiful day, he had decided to bring along his wife, his son and one of his brothers. The Princess Alice departed Swan Pier filled with joyful passengers looking forward to a lovely day out. She steadily made her way to Sheerness, stopping at a few other stations along the way, such as North Fleet, which was near the very famous Rocheville Pleasure Gardens. As the boat steamed along, passengers caught a glimpse of one of the sewage palaces, very beautiful buildings inside and out that pumped waste from the city into the Thames. This meant that the fresh air was punctuated by whiffs of the awful smell of sewage. Oh, I do like a bit of sewage. You gotta try my special sewage elixir. It keeps you young. Cures everything, keeps you young. Make sure to buy yours today. Yeah, I definitely won't be trying that. Don't listen to her. This video was sponsored by Gargi Sewage Elixir. Anyway, the Princess Alice arrived at Sheerness around 3pm and, as usual, stayed here for just over an hour. At 4.15 she began her journey back to London, quickly filling up with passengers for what was billed as the moonlight portion of the trip. Sounds lovely, don't you think? She was particularly crowded on this journey. There had been a railway disaster at Sittingbourne a few days earlier, where an express train had collided with a freight train. People were a bit scared of travelling by rail after this, and so opted to travel back on the Princess Alice, which they hoped would provide a safer and more enjoyable journey. Some passengers that had taken the trip down on other boats chose to return on the Princess Alice instead. After all, she was the Shah's boat. Philip and his wife Polly had decided to do exactly that. They boarded brimming with excitement for an enjoyable evening on the moonlit Thames. It certainly was a very happy scene on board the Princess Alice. The band was playing popular songs as people danced and sang along. Refreshments were flowing and laughter could be heard all around. Children played with dolls and picture books while the Bible class gave the band a run for their money with the wonderful hymns that they were singing. It was a beautiful summer's evening, the water glistening with the orange glow of the setting sun. The Princess Alice steamed off into the sunset, her passengers unaware of the tragic fate that awaited them. The Bywall Castle, a huge 890 ton collier, a ship that carried coal, had been sitting at Millwall Dock where it had just gotten a nice fresh coat of paint. Captain Harrison, who was part owner of the ship, was eager to get back out on the water. Time is money, you see. He needed to get back home to Newcastle as quickly as possible so that the ship could be loaded with coal that was bound for Alexandria in Egypt. 
The Thames was busy though, and the way out of the dock was blocked by other ships, so he would have to wait. Harrison wasn't new to the Thames, he was more familiar with international waters, as his usual route was between Newcastle and Africa. To make up for this, he had hired an experienced Thames pilot called Dix. Dix would help to safely guide the Bible Castle through the congested river's intricate twists and bends. At last, at around 6.30pm, the Bible Castle would receive the all clear to leave the dock. As she was doing so, a barge drifted into her path and the two collided, but thankfully the collision was minor and both vessels were unscathed. A collision already? That ship needs to stay in the dock. If only it did. The sun retreated even further, and darkness was just beginning to creep its way onto the river. It was around 7.30pm, and the Princess Alice had now reached Tripcork's Point, near Woolwich, and this was quite a nasty bend in the River Thames. The band was still playing, and some women were seen trying to dance a jolly polka, but failing because it was just so crowded on board. Philip and his wife Polly were having the best time. He was listening to her sing, and a crowd had gathered round her, and they clapped and they cheered. Captain Grinstead stood on the paddle box, looking ahead of him and giving directions to his crew. Some passengers followed the captain's gaze and had noticed that a large vessel was approaching. At first this wasn't concerning, but the ship continued directly towards them, not altering its course. The Princess Alice had reduced its speed and was going very, very slowly. As the large vessel drew closer, Captain Grinstead loudly shouted, Ease her! Stop her! Then turn her astern! the urgency in his voice increasing with each call he made. But the monster ship did not seem to respond. It was still approaching, dwarfing the Princess Alice. The captain was now filled with panic and shouted, where are you coming to? Good God, where are you coming to? The shrill screech of warning whistles tore through the evening air and the band stopped playing. Low murmurs turned into frightened screams. The passengers looked on in horror as the red hull of the Bywell Castle now towering high above them, collided with the Princess Alice near the paddle box. Those below deck weren't yet aware of the commotion that was happening above. The Princess Alice shuddered. The tables down below rocked from side to side and glasses clattered and shattered as they tumbled to the floor. Ornaments began to fall. These passengers realised that something wasn't right. They rushed upstairs, their panic rising, but nothing could prepare them for the terrors that would await. There was an awful grinding and crunching as the monster ship ripped through into the Alice's engine room and saloon. The passengers were in a panicked frenzy. There were screams of, Lord Jesus, save us, and good heavens, what shall we do? The front of the Princess Alice suddenly tipped forward, flinging passengers into the murky depths of the water below. Now, Victorian dresses were not made for swimming. They were stiff, they were restrictive, and they became so heavy with the water they absorbed, you might as well have tied lead weight to yourself. And, to top it off, most people couldn't swim. The sewage palaces emptied gallons and gallons of waste right at this spot. The water was thick with decomposed fermenting sewage that apparently hissed like soda water. The putrid smell and taste made people gag as the water rushed into their noses and mouths. People frantically thrashed about trying to keep afloat. Those that couldn't swim grabbed onto those that could, and people were pulling others down in a fight to keep themselves above water. A lucky few on the part of the deck that was slanted upwards managed to grab onto the anchor chains of the Bywell Castle and climb up these onto the ship. Once on board, they threw ropes over the bow of the ship so that others could climb up to safety. More people tried to climb up the anchor, but unfortunately were not so lucky. Some lost their grip and plunged into the river below, and eventually the Bywell Castle would lower her anchor, dooming any poor souls that were still clinging on. Philip called out to his wife Polly, telling her to quickly put her arms around his neck and hold on to him tightly. She did so, and told him, If we were to go, let us go together. He managed to get a hold of one of the ropes hanging on the Bywell Castle, and he twisted it around his hand. Soon there was a terrible groaning and creaking as the Princess Alice slipped in two. Both ends of the boat would point upwards towards the sky. Water rushed in and she began to sink in the centre. People slid like coals down a chute into the sewage-filled water. As the Princess Alice sank, Philip swung by the rope in front of the bow of the Bywell Castle. Polly was still clinging on to him for dear life. He managed to get a foothold on the side of the ship and he worked his way up hand over hand until they reached the top. He breathed a sigh of relief. They were nearly there. They were nearly to safety. Thank heaven, Polly, we have got to the top, he said. He would rest for just a moment, catch his breath, and then would continue their ascent. 
Well, Polly's arms were beginning to give way, though. Oh, Philip, I cannot hold on any longer, she said. And then she released her grip from around his neck and plunged into the water. Philip slid down the rope to find his beloved Polly, but she had disappeared into the depths of the Thames. He cried out for help, and the crew of the Bywell Castle heard him. They pulled him on board to safety. Now, the Bywell Castle crew really did try their best to help as much as they could. They threw over life buoys, planks, boxes, even chicken coops. They hung ropes all around the ship so that people could grab on, and eventually they were also able to launch their lifeboat, and this saved 14 lives. The water was filled with hundreds of people struggling for life. People clung onto anything that would float, and some managed to get a hold of the ropes. But holding onto these ropes was very difficult. You had to fight against the currents, the swells of water, the immense weight of Victorian waterlogged clothing, and potentially other people that had grabbed a hold of you. One man, a Mr George Hayne, saw that a woman was drowning. He grabbed a hold of her and managed to support the both of them, treading water to keep them both afloat. Things were not looking good, though. There were huge surges of water and the man was losing his fight to keep their heads above water. The struggle went on for quite a while. They'd almost given up hope. But then, a miracle. A little boat manned by the manager of the nearby Betton Gasworks came into their field of view. They were saved. The truly heroic boatmen from local factories and also from the boats that were moored nearby came to the rescue of many that night. Within four minutes, the Princess Alice had been completely swallowed up by the Thames. And it wasn't long before the screams and cries from the poor souls in the river turned to deathly silence. The Princess Alice's sister ship, the Duke of Tech, was only ten minutes behind, but by the time she'd arrived at the scene, it was already too late to help. Within twenty minutes, no one was left alive in the water. All that was left was a sea of hats, shawls, toys and bodies. All in all, it's thought that 130 people made it out alive. Sadly, neither Captain Grinstead or Polly were among these. Susanna also died, and it's thought that only five members of her Bible class survived. Those that were rescued were well taken care of and given fresh clothes, food and brandy, and a warm place to stay. The mayor had the town hall open its doors to survivors, and many kind residents opened up their homes as well. Unfortunately though, even if you survived the sinking, you weren't out of the woods yet. Several people died in the following weeks after getting sick from swallowing that sewage-filled water. The question of how many died would be one that was very difficult to answer. There were no passenger lists, tickets were interchangeable across the company's boats, and very young children didn't even require a ticket. It's estimated that 630 to 650 people lost their lives. In a single evening, entire families had been wiped out, children were orphaned and people were widowed. Watermen rushed to the scene to recover the bodies from the Thames. For each body they dredged up, they would earn a princely sum of at least five shillings. Competitions for those bodies was fierce, and fights even broke out because people really wanted that money. Some tried to exploit the tragedy to the extreme, offering to take sightseers on tours where they could gawk at the sight of the collision. Thieves would also try to strip the bodies of anything that looked valuable. The bodies recovered by the watermen were collected by steamers and laid out at various places like the Woolwich Town Hall. The bodies would have a number attached to them to make identification easier. The absolutely frantic search for lost loved ones would now begin. Packed trains arrived at the small town of Woolwich filled with people looking for their friends and also their relatives. There were also crowds of sightseers that came just out of pure morbid curiosity. The search was made much, much harder because the bodies had floated all along the River Thames, and many people arrived at Woolwich Town Hall only for their loved ones not to be there, because the bodies were stored near where they were found. Their long search would continue on to the Beckton Gasworks, to Creekmouth, to Raynham, to Erith, and some bodies were even found all the way in the opposite direction at Limehouse. Identifying the bodies would prove very difficult too. They were coated in an awful slime from the toxic sewage in the Thames, and the sewage made them decompose much quicker than usual. More and more bodies continued to be found, which raised the question, where would they all go? Well, it was up to the superintendent of the London Steamboat Company, William Taus, to sort out. How he managed to still carry out his duties, I will never know. The poor man must have been absolutely grief-stricken as he'd lost most of his family in the disaster. The military allowed one of the dockyard's large iron sheds to be used. In total, around 574 bodies were recovered, many of which were unable to be identified, and for these, a mass funeral took place. 
It's estimated that around 60 to 80 bodies still remained in the Thames, never to be found. There was of course a massive public outcry. How had such a disaster happened and who was to blame? Two inquests would be opened, one by a coroner and the other by the Board of Trade. The coroner's jury was made up of 19 tradesmen and shopkeepers who would hear a huge amount of evidence over the next two months. On the 14th of November, the coroner's jury finally released their verdict after 12 gruelling hours of deliberation. The verdict was that both vessels were to blame. The Bywell Castle should have eased, stopped and reversed its engines earlier and the Princess Alice contributed to the collision by not stopping and going astern. The inquest by the Board of Trade would meet a very different verdict though. They concluded that the Princess Alice was entirely at fault because she would ignored the Thames waterway regulation that states when two vessels are approaching each other from opposite directions they should pass on the left or port side of each other. The tragedy brought to light the terrible issue of sewage in the Thames and some positive change was made. Sewage was now to be treated and the solid part was to be separated from the liquid part and dumped out at sea. The Royal Albert Dock was opened in 1880 and this helped to keep small pleasure boats like the Princess Alice away from heavy goods vessels. A memorial to those killed in the disaster now stands in the Woolwich Cemetery, a beautiful white marble Celtic cross built using the donations from 23,000 people. As for the Bywell Castle, well that ship must have really been cursed because she went missing in 1883 on a voyage from Alexandria to Hull. If you got something from this video, Gargi and I would really appreciate it if you would like and subscribe. Stay safe, definitely don't try any of Gargi's sewage elixir, and I hope you have a magnificent day.